today we're wrapping up this uh, message series called Relational Vampires, and we've been talking about um, how as followers of Christ, we have a responsibility and we have to find a way somehow to love the people that suck the life out of us. And uh, over these four weeks, we've focused on the controlling people, the critical people, the needy people, and today we're talking about hypocritical people. Um, how many of you know at least one hypocrite? Don't we all? And I mean, probably you know several. And uh, that's probably the number one complaint of non-Christian people when they talk about the church or when they talk about Christians, they'll just say things like, well, they're just a bunch of hypocrites. What do they mean by that? Well, the word hypocrite is used in uh, Greek theater and it means a stage actor or somebody that wears a mask. And so a hypocrite is somebody who pretends to be something that they're not. We see that all around us. I mean, uh, they play the part of a Christian on Sunday, but they live like the devil through the week. That's my own definition. I, I kind of like that one. They, they, they play the role of Christian, but they live like the devil. There's this inconsistency between their life the life they live and their verbal testimony. And um, I think it's interesting to point out, Jesus had a zero tolerance policy for hypocrisy. He had no tolerance for it whatsoever. In fact, in Matthew chapter 23, he exposed the hypocritical attitudes of the religious leaders. He talked about the fact that they knew the scriptures, but they didn't live them out. They didn't care about being holy. They just wanted to look holy in order to receive the admiration of the people. Well, today, like the Pharisees, many people know the Bible, uh, but they don't allow it to change their lives. It really makes no difference in their day-to-day -day living. They say they follow Jesus, but they don't live by his standards, by the word of God. It's like uh, their actions don't match their beliefs. So seven times in this particular passage of Scripture that we're going to look at in uh, Matthew chapter 23, the phrase, woe to you hypocrites, it shows up again and again. Each time these words are coming from Jesus, and then he gets kind of to the end of his comments, and here's what he says about their lifestyle. This is in Matthew chapter 23, verse 28. He says, in the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, and this is where it really counts, on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. So the question this morning is, how do you deal with the hypocrites in your life? Uh, it may be your buddy who comes to church and acts like everything is normal while he stands up and sings and praises God with his arms outstretched, but you know good and well that he's cheating on his wife. Hypocrisy. It doesn't add up. It could be the kid at school who professes to be a Christian and he comes to youth group and he participates, he even volunteers to lead a small group, but he gets drunk on the weekend and he cheats on his tests and you see the imbalance there. What's wrong with this picture? It could be your boss. Uh, maybe he claims to be a Christian. He professes that he's a Christian, but he cheats his customers and he treats his employees like dirt. He operates the business with no integrity, and everybody sees it. So what is our role? What's our responsibility as Christians in situations like these? Do we even have a role? Uh, you know, or are we just to stand back and pray for them? Look the other way, let it go, don't say a word. What's a Christian to do? That's the question this morning. How are we to love those who proclaim one thing, but who live something entirely different? Well, kind of foundationally as we get started, what we need to do is understand why do they act that way? What causes this to happen? Why are they proclaiming one thing and trying to live something else? Why do these people live the lives of a hypocrite? Um, we're gonna ask that question and then uh, it'll help us determine how do we respond to them as followers of Christ. And there are several possible answers to the question, why do they live as hypocrites? Number one, in your notes or on the app if you're following along, maybe they don't know God. We have to be open to that possibility. Instead of being a hypocrite, it could be this person's not even a Christian. Maybe they're not even a follower of Christ. Maybe they don't even really profess it, but you imagine that they must be a Christian because they, you know, they sing the songs, they come to church, whatever, but maybe they don't even make a profession. Maybe they're not a hypocrite after all, because they've not accepted Christ. 
1 John chapter 2, verse 4 says, the man who says, I know him, talking about Jesus, but does not do what he commands, he's a liar, and the truth is not in him. It's a powerful passage of Scripture. It's a powerful verse. The man who says, I know him, talking about Jesus, but doesn't do what Jesus commands, he's a liar, and the truth is not in him. In other words, just because they go to church and they say they're a Christian, that doesn't necessarily mean that this person is actually following Christ. Jesus said it himself, not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Only those who do the will of my Father. Maybe they're not a hypocrite, after all, just a person in need of salvation. Maybe they just don't know God. That why they behave the way they do, that helps determine how we respond. Second possibility. Maybe they don't know any better. That's a possibility. Maybe they're new to the faith. Perhaps they haven't been taught how Christ calls us to live. In fact, uh, Paul was dealing with this problem at the church in Corinth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1, he says, Brothers, I couldn't address you as spiritual, but as worldly, mere infants in Christ. See, these were people who had been forgiven. They had been changed by Jesus, but they were just starting out. And so they're very early in their path of spiritual growth. And so uh, this was just a matter of spiritual maturity. These people in Corinth were baby Christians, infant Christians. And so this isn't a person that needs correcting. This is a person who needs instructing. See the difference? Uh, understanding why they act this way helps us determine what to do. Maybe they just don't know any better. And then there's a third possibility. Maybe they know better, but they're disobeying God. And this, this is the hypocrite. They know better, they're just disobeying God. They have chosen to dishonor God with the way that they live. That's what Peter was talking about over in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 16. He said, live as free men, just like we've been singing about this morning, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. He's basically saying, don't use your freedom as an excuse to do wrong or to sin. Don't use the grace of God as, as an excuse to live any way you want. Folks, this is how people slip into hypocrisy. They might start out by saying, well, you know, what I do, it's nobody else's business. It's nobody's business anyway. God's going to forgive me. And then they start to rationalize and justify their sinful behavior. And I'm telling you, human beings are masters at this. Ju justifying, rationalizing our sinful behavior. Well, you know, I'm not hurting anybody. It's nobody else's business. They, they compare themselves with others. You know, well, according to the way they live, I'm living better than they are. And they attempt to justify wrong behavior. A, a clear progression is taking place in their lives. It started out with justification, then it moves to rationalization, and then on to full-blown hypocrisy. They're using God's grace as an excuse to sin. And Peter says, hey, don't do it. Don't go down that road. Don't do that. Don't use your freedom as an excuse to do what's wrong. And uh, so the question is, what are we going to do as Christians? What do we do with people who have chosen to live like this? How do we handle hypocrisy? What's a believer to do? What's a believer to say in these situations? What are we to do with that person who testifies to being genuinely changed by Jesus Christ and yet who chooses to continually and willfully disobey God, the God they say they love? Is that any of our business? Do we just look the other way? Should we just pray for them and say nothing? I tell you, it's very important that we get this right. And it is going to have very specific application in some of your lives this very day. Because God's going to pull back the veil on something that you need to respond to, that you need to be aware of perhaps. And you need to think about how do I do that biblically? See, if we say nothing, we allow their poor witness to continue. And if we speak up and, and we get it wrong, we may push them further from God. That's why this is so critical. And so I want to share with you three prayers to pray. Three simple prayers that you can pray as you think about what it would look like for you to confront hypocrisy. Number one, pray this simple prayer. God, help me confront with a heart to restore. 
God, help me to confront this person with a heart to restore. See, the heart matters. And I would tell you that your approach to this person, it matters. Over in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, we read, Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him. See, to restore means to bring back, to make whole again. And as a believer, wouldn't you say that our heart should be that, that we have a heart to restore? We want restoration. We want healing. We want things to be right. Our desire is to bring the person back to God's original purpose for their lives and to do it gently and to do it humbly. Look at that entire verse, Galatians 6.1. This is in the Living Bible. Dear brothers, if a Christian is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help him back onto the right path, remembering, and this is key, that next time it might be one of you. That's who's doing wrong. It could be you the next time. Be aware of that. I mean, I love this Im imagery. We, we should gently and humbly help that person back on the right path. They wandered away, and we're going to help guide them back in the right direction, in the direction that God would have them to go. I would encourage you to think of it just like that. We are to be a guide, not to be the judge. It, it would help to keep that in mind. I am a guide, not a judge. It's not up to us to determine right and wrong. We're to provide gentle guidance and to lead the people in the way of life, the way of freedom, the way of truth. In other words, our goal is to be not say, hey, I'm right. Our goal is to gently help people back on the right path with God. That's why we restore them gently. We can't control how they respond to us, by the way. I, I've been down this road with people through the years, and you don't have any control over how they're going to respond to you, but we can make sure that we approach them gently and humbly and with a heart to restore. It's about our motivation. Um, I love the fact that Jesus loved people with grace and truth. We talk about that a, a lot around here. Uh, great examples over in John chapter 8 where we read about a woman who was caught in the act of adultery. And her accusers brought her before Jesus. And everybody said, you know, she needs to be stoned. That's what the law tells us. Now, if Jesus was all about grace, uh, he might have told her, don't worry about what you've done, if he was 100% grace. But we know Jesus is never going to say that. And if Jesus was 100% truth, he might say, hey, these guys want to stone you. They're right. You need to publicly repent of your sins, you filthy, wicked woman. But Jesus isn't going to say that either. What did he do? Well, he knelt down. And you remember the story. He began to write some things in the dirt while the people had gathered around. He was writing in the dirt with his finger, and we don't know what it was that he wrote. Some scholars think it might have been that he was writing out the sins of the people who were standing there, and I think that sounds reasonable. Because when Jesus uh, said that only the one without any sin should throw the first stone, everybody had a stone in their hand, and they heard him make that statement, and stones started hitting the ground as people dropped their stones, walking away from the oldest to the youngest. Evidently, the older men were more aware of their sin than the younger men. Uh, age and experience kind of has a way of tempering our youthful self-righteousness, doesn't it? Of all the people who wanted to stone her, nobody stuck around, nobody stayed. They all dropped their stones and they all walked away. Then Jesus went to the woman and he said, woman, where are your accusers? And then she said, they're all gone. And then this, in grace, he said, neither do I condemn you. And then in truth, he said, don't live like this anymore. There's a better way. There really is a better way. And I want you to be free. So you go and sin no more. 
grace and truth. That's Jesus. And that is a heart to restore. God help us, all of us, to confront whoever it is, family member, friend, your spouse, your children, with a heart to restore. It's so important that we get this right. A second uh, prayer to pray, God help me to confront carefully. That would be the second prayer. As you think about confronting the hypocrisy in the life of somebody that you love and care about, as God leads you, confront them carefully. Back to Galatians 6.1, brothers, if somebody's caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently, but watch yourself or you may also be tempted. Why should we be careful? Because we care for them. I mean, that's the heart of why we reach out because we care and we want to be very careful because the moment we put ourselves in the posture of the one who's correcting, we place ourselves in a very vulnerable position. Paul says, watch yourself. You have to be careful. He said something similar over in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. He said, if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. So when you confront, do it carefully. And in that moment when you think you're better than somebody else or you're above them, you open yourself up to the lies of the enemy. Uh, lies like, I'd never do what they did. Lies like, I'm better than that. See, it's so ungodly. How could they do such a thing? I would never. Let me tell you something. None of us, none of us are exempt. There's not a single one of us who are exempt. We are all vulnerable to sin and we are all susceptible to sin's deception. And that spirit of pride can easily slip in and make us even more vulnerable. So we pray. The third thing we pray, God, and this one's a heavy one, brace yourselves. God, help me see when I'm the hypocrite. God, help me see when I'm the hypocrite. Point out the hypocrisy in my life. If you go back in uh, Matthew chapter 23, you see that Jesus called the hypocrites blind fools. Uh, They're blind to their own hypocrisy. And uh, we talk about this often around here, but like so many sins, hypocrisy is tough to see in the mirror. It, it really is hard to see in the mirror. It's, it's so easy to point it out in others, but it's so difficult to see it in ourselves. And so we have to keep our heart open to the constant examination of the Spirit of God. And I absolutely love Psalm 139. I pray it often. We pray it here together from time to time. Search me, O God. Search me and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. It's about keeping your heart in check. And we all need that. David learned this lesson over in the Old Testament. He, he was the king and uh, he had, should have been out with his troops. He should have been at war, but instead he was on the rooftop of the palace and the, you know, the soldiers were out to battle, but he was laying back there at the palace and he's looking over the city when he saw this beautiful woman and he liked what he saw and so he had her brought to the palace. And you know the story, she was a married woman. He committed adultery with her. She sent word that she was pregnant and in an attempt to cover up his sin, he essentially had her husband murdered. Sin has a way of compounding, doesn't it? David committed another sin to try to cover up his initial sin. He sent this woman's husband into the battle on the front line and then he had the troops withdraw, leaving Uriah to be killed by the enemy. It was basically a staged murder. But human beings just have a way like David did, of justifying his behavior. He was totally blind to the hypocrisy of what he'd done. And one day the prophet Nathan comes to David, and Nathan, he came to confront David about his sin. But David had a heart to restore. And uh, so he tells David this simple story. He says, uh, you know, one time there was a rich man who had all kinds of livestock. He had plenty of sheep and cattle and everything, and there was also a poor man. 
And this poor dude, he just had one little lamb. That's it. That's all he had, one little lamb. It was like the family pet. Thing even came in and slept in the bed with the kids. And well, one day a guy came along and he was hungry. And this rich guy didn't, he didn't take one of his own animals from the livestock that he had to feed the man. Instead, he took this poor man's little lamb, the only lamb he had. He killed it and he fed the hungry traveler. And as this story is being told by Nathan, David's blood started to boil. And I'm telling you, it made him mad. He, how could anybody do such a thing? And this was like the worst thing that David had ever heard of. And he burned with so much anger against the man in the story that he finally told Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this is going to have to die. David was so fed up, he, you know, he's going to make this guy pay for the lamb four times over because he did such a horrible thing to this family. He had no pity. And then the prophet Nathan looked at David right in the eye and said, David, you're the man. David, you are the man. You're the hypocrite. This thing that you're so furious about is the thing that you have done, David. You have been too blind to even see your own sin and your own hypocrisy. Before you confront the hypocrisy in others, you have to make sure you have confronted the hypocrisy in your own life. And you do that by allowing the Spirit of God to examine your heart, getting the log out of your own eye before you remove the speck from somebody else, remembering that we are not the judge, we are the guide. And that is exactly what James was talking about over in James chapter 5, verses 19 through 20. He says, my brothers, if any one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring him back, remember this. Whoever turns the sinner from the error of his ways will save him from death and cover over a multitude, a multitude of sins. And that's why we have to get this right. We confront with the heart to restore because when Satan tries to take away one from the flock, you should be the one that lovingly helps guide them back to truth and, and save them from spiritual pain and let the grace of Jesus cover a multitude of sins as you do so. And guess what? One day, you or I may be the one who takes the step off the path. And don't you want somebody there who loves you enough to lead you back to Christ? We continue pointing people to him. That's what we want to do as Christians. We want to continue pointing people to him. And so th this morning... <clears throat> As we come to the conclusion of this series, I want to ask you a question. Has God spoken to you at all over these four weeks? Has he spoken to you in this series? I mean, we've been talking about the controlling people, the critical people, needy people, hypocritical people. I mean, we've talked about loving those people in need, and we admit the fact that we're all needy people, and even today, as we prepare our hearts for communion here in a few moments, the Bible tells us that we're to examine our own hearts before we receive the elements. Paul warns us nobody should participate in the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. And none of us, nobody here is worthy on your own, but because of Christ, he's the one who makes us worthy. We are sinners saved by grace. And so we're to prepare ourselves by examining our hearts. And so I just want to ask you this morning, are there any barriers that affect your relationship with Jesus today? Are there any barriers that are impacting your relationships with others? See, communion is for believers only. Those who know their sins are forgiven. The bread uh, symbolically represents the body of Jesus Christ that was broken for all of us. The juice represents Christ's blood that was shed for us. Here at the point, we serve what is known as open communion. What that means is you don't have to be a member of this local church to participate. The only requirement is that you know your sins are forgiven. You're on your way to heaven. From a biblical perspective, there's no set age when kids are allowed to participate here. We just ask that parents would guide their children as soon as you feel like they're old enough to understand the meaning and significance of this sacrament today. Once you receive the elements, 
Uh, I'm gonna invite you to participate on your own right there at your seat. And the cups can be deposited in the receptacles as you ask, exit the worship center today. And I ask the ushers if they would to take their place as we pray. And I'd ask you to bow your heads with me, please. Lord Jesus, <clears throat> we need your help to get this right. And uh, we want to honor you in the way we love the people in our lives who are sometimes just difficult to love. And today, we especially, we pray for hypocritical people. We all know them. Some of us would confess we have been them. We pray for a loved one today, a brother, a sister, a friend, someone who's making wrong decisions and heading in the wrong direction spiritually. Help us have the heart of a guide, not the attitude of a judge toward them. And may we each and every one be open to your spirit examining our own heart this morning in these quiet moments before we're served in the same way that you love us with grace and truth. I pray that you would empower us to love the people that you bring into our lives with grace and truth as well. We pray for wisdom and courage in these things. We now ask that you would examine our hearts as we receive the elements of communion, the bread representing your broken body and the cup which represents your shed blood as it reminds us of the incredible price you paid for our sin. And for those who've not responded to your mercy, love, and grace today, by receiving the gift of eternal life that is available to all of us, my prayer is that this would be their day. Bless now this time as we continue on in worship. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, ushers.